Hi, welcome to ACF Chefs Forums. Before we dive into today's webinar on best practices for outdoor dining, we'd like to thank Ecolab for sponsoring the session and thank you all for joining us at our rescheduled date. For those unfamiliar with the American Culinary Federation, ACF, we are the leading organization for culinary professionals offering education, certification, and a community for chefs and food service leaders. If you're not yet a member, this is a great reason to join this kind of webinars, this kind of education. Outdoor dining spaces are becoming key to restaurant success with 65% of operators now offering outdoor seating. However, maintaining these spaces, especially pet friendly spaces, come with its own set of challenges. Today, we'll learn from Ecolab expert, Laura Urick about best practices for keeping these areas clean, safe, and profitable. Feel free to ask any questions of Laura uh, using the Q&A feature down at the bottom. Um, and we can get started with a chat, which is separate. And that's where I wanna know where you guys are tuning in from and what is your outdoor dining season? I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, and it's pretty much year round, unless it's hurricane season. I am JJ Vitali, ACF's Director of Communications, and I'm really glad to be here with you. So now let's meet our presenter. Laura Yurek is Senior Technical Account Specialist at Ecolab. Laura supports Ecolab's corporate account managers and sales teams with technical expertise, product guidance, and science-based solutions to help address common challenges in outdoor dining. And I'm gonna hand it over, take it away. Awesome, thank you, JJ. I will share my screen and we can get started. Awesome, well, thank you for having me. I am very excited to be here today to talk about best practices in outdoor dining and patio operations. Um, I uh, am, to answer JJ's original question, joining from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, so normally our outdoor dining season hits around the summertime, springtime, um, but it's actually 75 to 80 degrees and sunny here today in October, which is uh, a little bit of a different situation for us. So our outdoor dining season definitely seems to be expanding. Um, and as we see that trend happening around the industry, uh, this is a big question that comes up on how to best keep these spaces clean um, and operable for your guests of the restaurant um, and how to best maintain these in all seasons. So I'll just dive in with a quick little intro on who Ecolab is. Um, so Ecolab is a chemical providing company, but we like to make sure that we are providing you with so much more outside of just the cleaning solutions that you are using in your spaces. So yes, we are partnering with you on the uh, products that you're using to clean your, uh, your countertops, your floors, your dishes and your dish machines, the dish machines that might be in your kitchen. But we also wanna make sure that we are providing the best insights into those procedures, guidance on regulations where some of those products are involved, giving the best tips on how to optimize your operations um, and uh, really providing that whole well-rounded service that um, in in a restaurant space as best as we can um, outside of just sending uh, sending everyone the chemicals. So that's where a webinar like this comes in today on providing some of those best tips and practices on how to utilize your cleaning tools uh, in these spaces. So quick introduction on myself. Uh, my name is Laura Yurick. I am a senior technical account specialist at Ecolab in our institutional division, which specifically covers restaurants, hotels, uh, and other um, commercial facilities. Um, so my role is essentially to help our uh, sales team from a technical standpoint with some of our largest customer asks that, um, that get into those more technical spaces. Um, so things like webinars with procedures, uh, product mixes, that's where my team becomes kind of the experts there. Um, and we often get asked to do things like webinars like this. So that's what uh, brings me to join you guys today. So let's jump in a little bit on outdoor dining. Um, and as JJ mentioned, feel free to throw uh, questions in that uh, question feature as we go. Um, and um, I can't see that feature, but they'll be bringing me those questions as we go. So. Um, we'll either get to them during the presentation or at the end. Um, feel free to keep sending them in at any point, though. So 
outdoor dining. Uh, let's go over some of the basics of it and why it is so important to our operations now. So one of the main reasons that you'll have outdoor dining is to attract your customers to your restaurants. Um, I'm sure everyone here has dined at a restaurant and uh, often when you're on looking for where you want to go, sometimes depending on the season, when it's uh, maybe like here unseasonably warm, one of the main things that you're looking for when you choose a place is that option of that outside dining space for wanting to go there. Uh, so um, about 65% of restaurant operators say that they offer out some sort, sort of outside dining space in some portion of that year. Um, this obviously very much expanded as well. Um, we went through a global pandemic a couple years ago and outdoor dining really exploded around that time as that was the safest place to go to a restaurant and enjoy the company of people who were not within your household. Um, so with that time, we saw definitely an increase in the amount of places that uh, prioritized having a patio or an outdoor dining space and um, also in the prioritization on keeping it open as long as possible. So that brings me to the, my, my next point on, um, we were talking about some of when the, uh, based on your location, when is your outdoor dining season? Um, only 30%, 36% of the operators who report having an outdoor space say that they're able to keep that space open year round. Now, we obviously have I've seen some uh, different tools that really come in to help expand those seasons. Um, around us, we have a lot of heaters, so uh, you can even sit outside around in 30 degree weather when it's snowing uh, and things like misters in some of those hotter areas when it's the summer um, and it otherwise might be unbearable to sit outside. So we definitely see people trying to stretch that application as long as possible because of those really big benefits from having those outdoor spaces. Um, so what are some of those benefits? One of the biggest ones is driving profits. So in addition to the fact that people might be specifically seeking out a restaurant just for having its outdoor space, um, we also see a very big uptick in the profits just due to the uh, addition of more seal, uh, seating available in our space. Um, we all know in a restaurant space that uh, moving seats and uh, rotating those tables and having as much seating available as possible is the best way to drive that revenue. Um, so having the availability of an additional space is definitely uh, very helpful in increasing that profit. Um, and during those operational seasons, we have 35% of operators that say that that uh, outdoor space accounts for more than 40% of their daily average in sales during those seasons where uh, the patio is operational. Um, additionally, um, thinking about the um, expansion of uh, guests that we allow on our patios, uh, with um, younger generations coming up, one thing that we definitely have noticed is the desire to want to bring your pet uh, to as many places as possible. We see that trend in a lot of different industries um, and the food industry is no exception there. So um, wanting to make sure that you can bring your pet to dine with you in those outdoor spaces is definitely something that we've seen really tick up. Um, and in 2022, the FDA actually amended the food code to allow for pets in outdoor dining spaces where it's approved based on uh, local regulations. Um, but that overarching guide from the uh, from the national stage of the National Food Code um, trending towards having pets in outdoor spaces uh, definitely really shows us where that industry is going on wanting, make, wanting to make sure that we have uh, those uh, that avail availability to house those extra guests. Um, and obviously with having pets in outdoor spaces that can lead to additional cleanliness challenges that we wanna make sure that we have all the tools to address. So um, I'm going to do this presentation in kind of two different main sections. Going to start with going through some general cleaning procedures and tips and tricks on the patio spaces. Um, and then the second half will dig a little bit further into uh, pests specifically and how we can look at uh, mitigating our, um, our, our pest uh, issues that we might have on those outdoor spaces. So first thing to go through, um, this is a good tip or trick for inside or outside, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about how this might differ specifically with those outdoor spaces. 
Um, but table sanitation is one of the most important things to showcasing to a uh, restaurant diner, um, a, um, a cleanly space. Um, no one wants to sit down at a table and immediately notice that it's dirty or hasn't been cleaned properly. Uh, and that will be one of your first things that you'll notice and uh, give you a, a, an immediate reaction to how cleanly you think the overall restaurant is. So table sanitation is definitely a very important thing that we want to uh, be pro following the proper procedures on. So um, we always recommend a uh, food contact sanitizer be used on table surfaces um, as we consider them a, a food contact surface. Um, this can sometimes vary with local regulations so uh, that um, you can also monitor locally for what the regulations call for but we tend to take the uh, specific guidance to always use a food contact sanitizer in these spaces. So um, general procedures, this is one area that, um, that Ecolab tends to see uh, challenges with following the full procedures of the uh, food contact sanitization process. Um, so um, every food contact sanitizer uh, has to be registered with the EPA. Um, and in that process, the EPA labels will have specific instructions on how to go about cleaning for these specific claims, such as food contact sanitization. So for the food contact sanitization, if you follow procedures on uh, most, of our, or most food contact sanitizers, what you see um, is that usually you have a first step on cleaning and that often doesn't get followed in spaces. Um, to make sure that we're following those, those regulations to clean as we should be for food contact spaces, um, we really want to make sure that we push those procedures to be followed correctly. So correct order would be to first clear the surface of any uh, visible debris. So trash, wiping off crumbs, where we're thinking about outdoor spaces, this is where things come in like dirt, leaves, um, you might get insects on that space that you want to make sure you clear before doing your, your sanitization process. Um, if it's been raining and you have standing water, may, make sure to wipe that down before uh, going in and doing your cleaning process. Um, but then the first step is to use a product that can be used as a general cleaner. So this could be the same product as your food contact sanitizer, or it might be a separate product. But to do first a cleanliness step of doing a wipe down with a product for a general clean. Um, you could also use a uh, more... Um, more heavy disinfectant if you wanted to as well. An example of this might be, um, let's say somebody left food on the table and you had uh, pests that were attracted to that table and landed on that table like birds. Um, so maybe you wanted to make sure that you got better disinfection just to make sure you were fully cleaning that surface. You could use something like a multi-purpose disinfectant that has um, much more extreme virus kill claims um, as that first step as well. You just want to make sure that then you're going back with that food contact sanitizer after. Um, so then uh, per the instructions, um, you'll likely need a rinse with water. Um, this can just be potable water um, in a spray bottle or on a rag, whatever is easiest there. Um, use that, that rinse step and then you'd go back with your food contact sanitizer, making sure to wet that surface thoroughly. Um, and then uh, making sure to let the product sit for the contact time that's allocated on the label as well. Um, so uh, that's another thing that will come with that EPA registration of that product. The food contact sanitization kill claims will have a specific contact time that you could find on that label. And we want to make sure that we are letting surfaces sit wet for the amount of time that they need to to get those kill claims. So if it's a minute, five minutes, we want to make sure to let the, that table sit for that amount of time with that product on it. So um, in addition to that table sanitization, what about the chemicals that we are using for that sanitization? So um, with food contact sanitizer, the two applications that we'll most often see um, on how we are applying that chemical will either be a spray bottle or a sandy bucket. Um, this is up to individual locations on what you prefer. Um, either is uh, perfectly acceptable with the product labels as long as it's listed in a way to apply the product on those labels. Um, so when we are thinking about how we want to store these, 
Um, one big thing with uh, where we are storing them is that if we have a way to store them either inside of the doors that lead to the patios or in a well-covered area, uh, this is going to be the best to make sure that you are maintaining that chemical solution for as long as possible. So um, with our sanitization solutions, we will need to change them out once they are falling out of that spec that you'll be testing with test strips. Um, so we want to make sure that we uh, are maximizing that life cycle and keeping them out of things like direct sunlight or away from water contamination, especially where we have like a sandy bucket um, with an open top or uh, dirt contaminants. Um, if it's windy and you might be blowing dirt and sand um, or uh, full particles like leaves, we want to make sure that we're keeping those out of our sanitizing solution, such as a bucket. Um, to that as well, uh, spray bottles can definitely be um, easier to utilize outside because you don't necessarily have that open reservoir uh, for, um, for contaminants to get into. Um, so spray bottles, uh, if they are within your operations, are definitely a recommended procedure, but the sandy buckets can still work. We just want to make sure that we are storing them in a place that's either well covered inside and that we are changing them when we see that visible um, any visible debris, or when we are starting to see uh, the water start to become really dirty. Um, you also should be testing your sanitization solutions regularly. Um, so uh, your chemical providing company should be providing you or uh, letting you know how you can order test strips that are specific to the type of sanitizer you have, um, whether that's a quat based sanitizer or a uh, different kind of sanitizer want to make sure that you have the correct test strips to test that solution and that you're regularly utilizing those to make sure that your solutions in spec um, and changing that when it comes out of spec or like I said, when there's visible debris. Okay, getting a little bit more into table busing. So as I mentioned, um, we'll have some specific pest stuff uh, in a little while in the presentation. Um, but leaving unfinished food on tables is one of the easiest ways to attract pests to a space. Um, so um, we know that places can often be short staffed. Um, you might only have one person who's able to work the patio. So this can be a little bit um, difficult to do, but as as much as possible, trying to um, to bus tables as uh, quickly as possible after a party leaves, um, especially when they're leaving food on their plates, will be really helpful to try to uh, help avoid attracting insects and animals to that space. Um, we also would recommend uh, with, um, with busing buckets. So you might have one busing bucket available out on the patio that's used specifically for those, trying to bring those back to kitchens frequently um, instead of leave, letting them sit for a while um, will also help eliminate that risk as well. Um, another thing with uh, not busing tables quickly, if we're not in a shaded space, you might have sunlight directly on those wares. Um, if you're still having any, if you have uh, food residue on those wares, that can really bake some of those food soils onto that surface, making them harder to clean on first pass in a dish machine. Um, so we'd also recommend where you have those patio spaces, making sure that you're really utilizing a pre-soak solution uh, ahead of your first run through the dish machine. That'll really help to loosen up some of those soils so that you're not necessarily having to um, re-run the wares through the dish machine multiple times or scrub at them as well. We want to try and avoid those. Um, so utilizing a pre-soak can definitely be helpful to help mitigate some of those issues. Um, with the uh, with wares uh, sitting out in the sun. Okay, floors. Um, floors is definitely one of the most difficult substrates that we have to clean in a restaurant space. Um, back of house is obviously a very challenging area as we get grease build up. Um, front of house, we might be dealing with uh, people walking in and out, bringing in things from the outside. Um, but when we think about the outside, uh, that becomes an another challenge entirely. So um, first steps when you're opening a patio that'll be good to think about is what is the substrate of the, uh, the, the ground that your patio is on? 
Um, is it a wood deck? Are you on concrete? Um, is it a tile surface that, that's similar to the inside? Um, note what that substrate is and uh, work with the, the um, either the manufacturer of the different substrate that you have out there or your chemical manufacturer um, and provider to come up with the best solution for that specific substrate and consider whether or not it needs to be different from your inside floor cleaners or the procedures as well. Um, wood is a good one to think about on this. Um, wood can be especially, uh, especially sensitive to water. Um, if it's outdoor wood, then we worry about it a little bit less because it's probably been finished to help avoid moisture deterioration. Um, but we uh, generally where inside, we might rec recommend procedures like deck brushing to really get at some of those greasy soils. Um, outside, we look more at something like using a damp mop procedure on wood flooring. So that's just an example of where procedures might vary from inside to outside. Um, and we also want to make sure then that we are testing the substrates that they are compatible with the specific chemistries that we're using as well. Um, Another big thing with outside is that uh, you often are going to get potentially more um, more visible debris before uh, going in for those uh, full cleaning steps um, than you would inside. So inside, you probably do get food build up on the floor. Um, outside, you're going to still get that. But additionally, you might have things like this the autumn season. We see a lot of leaves blowing around. Um, dirt just in general, tracking onto those patio spaces can be much heavier. Um, so it is really important to, uh, if you have that heavy debris, go through with a broom and remove that debris prior to doing your cleaning step with your chemical. This really just gets that, 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 that surface in the best place possible before going through the chemical to allow chemicals to do their job. Um, if we have things like debris that's impeding that, it's not going to get you the best results. So we want to make sure that we are removing that visible debris before going in with the chemicals. Um, and then on the inside part as well, um, which we are obviously talking about outside, but one consideration we might want to think about with the inside when your patios are in operation is uh, the walkways that lead to those patios and um, and bringing in dirt or debris from the outside as well. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we have availability options um, up in Minnesota sometimes to have patio open patios open in the winter. Um, so bringing in things like snow or salt from the outside can be common. Um, in the summer months, you might be bringing in dirt. If it's raining, mud. Um, so just making sure that thinking about when those patios are open, uh, do I have to have someone spot clean those walkways to those spaces more frequently than I might in normal operations? Um, and it might be something that you can then match to the spot cleaning frequency of your front walkway. Um, and you just want to make sure that you include that patio walkway uh, during the, the operable seasons as well. Okay, spill cleanup. So um, talked a little bit about leaving food out and the attraction of, uh, of pests. We wanna make sure that we think about that um, additionally with uh, spill cleanup. So um, sometimes if you're outdoors, um, you've got an example in the picture on this slide of a sadly dropped ice cream cone. Um, sometimes if you're outside, you might think, oh no, I dropped my ice cream cone on the concrete floor but it's outside, so it doesn't necessarily need to be cleaned up. Um, one thing uh, that we wanna make sure that we look at with the patio spaces is getting that cleaned up as quickly as possible because what that will really do is attract pests to your space. So even if it's on a floor um, and it is outside, we wanna make sure that we're trying to mitigate that spillage as much as possible. Um, so uh, when we get those spills, um, one big thing to look at will be a dish similar to the floors. Um, even if it's on a tabletop, we'll be trying to soak up any of those spills um, or wipe them away if they are uh, solids before applying the cleaning solution. So the example of the ice cream cone that we have there, um, I'd ideally probably want to go in with a dry rag ahead of, uh, ahead of mopping up with um, using my cleaning solution, but to try to soak up some of that, that liquid 
uh, so that I'm really giving my chemical full reign on the surface to actually do its job. Um, so uh, making sure that we get to these quickly and that we take pro proper procedures to get them cleaned up as quickly as possible to help mitigate those pests, which like I said, we will get into some more pest specific uh, examples and, um, and information in on the back half of these slides. So I mentioned this in the intro a little bit, but last thing that I wanna talk about from a general cleaning perspective with patios is that uh, uptick in pet friendly patios. So definitely something that we are seeing more often. Um, and I think that I've, I've definitely been hearing more about some state regulations also now starting to include indoor pet friendly dining options as well. So some of this information can also be relevant to those, uh, those inside spaces as well. Um, as that starts to trend starts to increase as well. Um, so with pets, we, we love having them in our spaces, but we do want to make sure that we are correctly cleaning for um, any incidents that we might have from pets. Um, so one of the big issues that we can think about is uh, maybe untrained pets having an accident in your space. And how do we go about making sure that we clean that up correctly? So um, this is where uh, instead of utilizing a food contact sanitizer, if we have a pet spill, what we really want to do is make sure that we're utilizing a multi-purpose disinfectant um, to go in and, uh, and clean up those spills. So starting with um, similar to a food spill, mopping up any of the uh, or soaking up any of the um, any of the liquid or solid from that spill and then going in with the multi-purpose disinfectant, uh, making sure that we get a contact time for, uh, for disinfection claims, um, and, then, um, and then wiping that surface clean will be the best procedure to make sure that we are uh, adequately getting those claims. Um, this might also be a, uh, an example of where you might want to introduce a multi-purpose disinfectant to that first step when you're cleaning uh, tables as well. Um, if you tend to get uh, a lot of pets in your spaces and you see maybe a lot of uh, drooling on tabletops or that sort of thing, um, it could be an option to introduce that multi-purpose disinfection, disinfectant cleaner on those table surfaces as well um, to make sure that you're getting uh, correct virus kill claims for anything that could be spread either pet to pet or um, additionally from there. Um, another good tool that can, that we might want to introduce if we have a lot of pets in our spaces is a specific odor eliminator. Um, so restaurants, we tend not to like to introduce, um, air fresheners ex outside of the restroom space, just because we have uh, a lot of food smells already going on and we don't want to compete with those. Um, so we like to not be necessarily adding anything to the air. But um, there are specific market products available that would look at odor elimination, especially around where, um, where bio odors that might come from pets are involved. So the example I show on the screen is actually an enzymatic cleaner that uh, is targeted to go after bio odors. Um, there's plenty like this on the market that would be available that you could look into. Um, and these are specifically helpful at targeting and destroying bio or uh, any sort of bio odor that might come from something like a pet accident or just from having uh, pets in those outdoor spaces. Um, especially if you utilize something like uh, like soft surfaces, like soft couches or soft chairs in a patio um, that you might have pets on, this could be a really good tool. Um, a lot of the times with these enzyme-based solutions too, you wanna make sure you utilize them not necessarily as an air freshener spraying into the air, but we more want to spray them directly onto the surface where we're having those bio odors coming from. Um, and this will really help uh, get in there with the enzymes and destroy those body odors and the actual source that it's coming from. So um, another good tool that can be utilized if you have uh, a pet friendly patio and you're struggling with any odors in those, in those spaces. Or like I said, indoor, indoor dining as well, if that's uh, something that um, is starting to become popular in your area and you see it trending towards that, it might be a good thing to start looking into how to best uh, clean your spaces when you have pets in them. Okay, 
Um, I'm now going to transition a little bit into talking about pest prevention, but uh, I'll pause for a moment. Any questions that we have in the chat so far on the general cleaning that we want to cover ahead of going to pest? Doesn't look like anyone's put any in yet, so. Awesome. Okay, well, um, we can keep going then. Sounds good. Okay, so uh, pest prevention with a patio space. Um, definitely one of the uh, hot topics when we think about patios. Um, I'm sure everyone, like myself, has been chased down by angry bees going after your either fruity drinks or sweets on a patio. Um, so we want to make sure that we think about how to best control these substances for or these um, these pests for the best dining experience. Um, so one thing that we want to think about is the pests that we might be encountering in our space. What are we commonly seeing? Most paid places are going to be dealing with rodents. That's obviously a very common one. Um, but depending on the season, what's something that uh, you might be having issues in your space? Is it stinging insects in the winter or in the summer? Is it mosquitoes in the summer? Um, ants seasonal as well, um, birds specific to times of years, cockroaches, pretty common yearly problem that you're probably gonna see. Um, and we wanna make sure that we ask ourselves what pests specifically are we seeing and what might be attracting them to this area. Um, we have uh, a team of pest experts that um, utilized them to pull together some of this information and they do a ton of research on studying which pests are responding to um, specific triggers. So what's attracting the pest to the space? Is there, um, is there a specific pest solution that we can mitigate it? Is it looking more at the cleanliness procedures that we're following? And that might be what's attracting the pest to the space. Um, is it our dumpsters behind the building that might be drawing those, uh, those pests in? Um, so making sure to uh, address the issues that you might be having based on what might be attracting that specific pest to the area will be really helpful to make sure that you're taking the proper mitigation tools into consideration um, for your pests. So a couple examples here um, and things that we want to make sure that we really look at when we are, when we are mitigating pests. Um, so sanitation, like I mentioned, um, whether your, pa your uh, patio might be located near your dumpster um, or you have trash cans available uh, on those surfaces, um, this is definitely a big thing that can attract pests to those spaces. So um, we have en um, emptying trash cans daily on here. Um, might, maybe even need to be something that's more frequent, uh, especially during some of those seasons with like heavy bees on uh, on the surfaces or really big fly seasons, um, getting those trash cans emptied uh, at least daily, uh, especially before closing at night. We don't want to leave trash sitting outside overnight. Um, that'll be really helpful to, uh, to mitigating pests in those spaces. Um, we covered in the cleaning procedures that we want to make sure that we clean up spilled material as quickly as possible. Um, and then just in general, cleaning those surfaces regularly as well. Um, so whether that's the floors or the tabletops, making sure that we are uh, following good uh, regularly regular cleaning procedures and especially those night closing procedures um, to make sure that those spaces are uh, sanitized well as that's one of the biggest things that's going to draw in pests and one of the easiest things instead of just immediately going towards expensive pest solutions that you can do with the tools that you already have on site to help limit uh, limit pest issues that you're having. Um, flying insects, like uh, especially flies, one thing that can definitely be done to help with those is air movement. Um, so introducing fans to your outside areas, uh, we see these a lot. Sometimes when you're in some of the southern states, some of those hotter climates, um, you can think fans might be out there to, to help with, um, with cooling guests down, which is definitely another benefit. But uh, having air movement definitely also helps uh, keep pests away from those spaces. Um, so if you have the ability to have uh, fans, whether that's through if you have kind of a ceiling feature where you can have fans, 
or even just um, standalone fans in those spaces, um, this can definitely help with things such as uh, heavy flying insect contamination. Um, perimeter treatments, when you do get more into um, specific pest solutions, um, looking at uh, what are the points of entry? Where are these pests getting in? Um, patios can be very difficult because um, you're already outside. There's lots of points of entry. Um, almost anything, when you consider flying insects, is a point of entry. So perimeter treatments can definitely get a little bit more uh, difficult in those outdoor spaces. Um, but thinking about um, are there different perimeter treatments that we can do uh, to help treat these spaces um, is definitely uh, something that um, that should be looked into. Um, and additionally, thinking about perimeter treatments when you're when you're operating your patio for your inside, think about that uh, that extra flow of people coming in from your patio. That's another point of entry that you might want to look at controlling. Um, so how can we best look at that um, and to make sure that just by operating a patio, we're not also increasing our pest issues indoors as well. Um, targeted surface treatments. Uh, this can be especially helpful with things like flies um, and on where they land. Um, like I said, we have a we have a specific pest division here that does a lot of research on uh, on activity of different pests. Um, and they uh, they've gone so far with flies to even study their their movements to the point of uh, trying to mimic as best knowing what a fly is going to do. They'll uh, they'll use an enclosed space and release a fly and watch its movements and write down every single thing that it does um, so that they can best come up with um, how do we know if a fly is going to land on that surface Um and then figure out what's the best way to then uh, either attract flies to different surfaces or treat the surfaces that they are going to land on to make sure that we are um, that we are able to then mitigate and kill them. Um, so that's another good thing where you're thinking about specific uh, issues with something like flies. Um, standing water uh, can be a big one um, that is, that can attract pests as well especially thinking about something like like fruit flies or some of those small flies that you get. Um, standing water can be a really big attraction area. Um, also just generally not good for um, for uh, general cleanliness of the space. This is one thing that um, an inspector might immediately look at and um, take some uh, take some guys to if they see standing water in a space. So making sure that we eliminate that. Um, so one of the big things with that, especially if you're going to have rain in your space, um, looking at where uh, where rain might gather and making sure that we have a way to clear that standing water out, wiping down tables after it rains, chairs after it rains, not to leave that standing water around for long periods of time. Um, and then screening and physical barriers is also another option. Um, I think this this can be especially popular in areas where we see some of those uh, some of those flying insects get especially bad. Um, but screened in porches uh, are definitely a good way to uh, introduce another physical barrier that just makes it more difficult to have pests get in and contaminate your space. So um, obviously, a um, little bit more could be more expensive, more extreme of a of a measure, but if you are having issues operating your patio in lots of different seasons um, with those flying insects and you've tried a lot of things, nothing seems to be working, physical barriers can sometimes be a good thing to turn to. So, Laura, we actually got a question here. Um, one of our attendees is fighting with flies and yellow jackets. Mm. They evidently love barbecue. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, so uh, flies and yellow jackets, um, barbecue makes sense, um, especially think about some of the sauces that you get, some of that sugary attraction, that'll be uh, one of the big things that they're going for. Um, I would say in terms of recommendations, some of the things that we've already talked about would be um, would be specifically helpful. So um, thinking about uh, barbecue can be a very messy meal. Um, so making sure that you get in there and regularly wipe down those tables after diners are, are done and leaving that space 
can definitely be really helpful that we're not getting any of those sugary substances remaining behind on our table surfaces. Um, additionally, maybe even introducing uh, more regular floor cleaning if we're getting uh, regular spillage on floors, um, that could be another attraction. And things like uh, trash, dishes, all of that, getting out those out of there as quickly as possible. So um, trash cans, if you have uh, self trash cans where your guests can throw away their own plates, um, if they are more paper, making sure that that gets emptied very regularly um, will be very important. Um, if you're bussing tables, getting those dishes out of that space as quickly as possible will definitely help. Um, if you uh, are struggling further um, from looking at kind of some of those cleaning procedures. That's usually how we tackle things first. If you're still struggling after that, then um, if you don't have a pest provider, um, I'd recommend uh, potentially reaching out to one at that point to look at um, specific treatments um, that can be done for those specific pests. But most often with some of those flying insects and in those, those spaces, especially with something like barbecue, um, operating those cleaning procedures will be definitely very helpful. Um, I would say, too, back to the point on the air movement, if you have even the opportunity to introduce fans, that can be really helpful with things such as bees um, to really see a good, uh, not elimination, but a reduction in them. So um, if you have the opportunity to throw a couple fans on your patio, that could definitely be uh, a helper. Oh, good question. Okay, so we've got a couple of fun case studies that we threw in here too, just to walk through um, how uh, how our team tends to go around uh, go about looking at when we when specific customer issues come in, um, how we uh, look at helping recommend solutions. Um, so uh, this was a situation where we had a, a restaurant that had a uh, regular practice of having peanuts available on tables for guests. Um, so think about kind of a sports bar vibe where you might have just um, bowls of peanuts around the space on tables. Um, but some of those uh, spillage of the shells on the ground and the peanuts um, were causing uh, especially um, high rodent populations to uh, be attracted to these spaces. Um, so um, by allowing that floor to really build up with some of those uh, those shells and leaving them for too long, that was one of the issues that they were seeing with those, those rodent populations. Um, so how do we go about implementing a solution on that? Um, so we look at the practices that might be causing that right from the beginning. We can see that the peanuts likely are some of the issues that they're seeing. Um, and then uh, what can we do to help recommend a solution? So this was a case that looking at uh, sanitization or san sanitation um, was one of the uh, big first things that we could look at for a recommendation. So letting uh, food shells regularly uh, build up on the ground and not cleaning them up in a timely matter um, was one of the main issues that was causing this problem. So we don't want to necessarily say, well, you just shouldn't have peanuts out because that's uh, not necessarily conducive to how, uh, um, how the restaurant wanted to be operating. Um, we instead want to look at, well, what can we do to change that practice uh, to make it a little bit more sustainable and reduce those the, those rodent um, occurrences. Um, so some examples of that, things like having shell bowls, instead of just having bowls for the peanuts that people are using, introduce also having a bowl on the table where you can put the shells versus just having people throw them on the ground. Um, floor cleaning procedures, uh, making sure that we are regularly floor cleaning um, if we have uh, peanuts in the space, potentially might even be something that you have to go in and clean more regularly. Um, it's also another really good example of the uh, physical debris on a space that you might want to go in and clear before doing a chemical clean. So something where um, introducing a broom would be uh, very helpful to get some of those, um, those finer particles of, that, of those peanuts, as well as um, clearing in general, the, the larger shells out of the way to then do your mopping procedures. Um, 
Additionally, the floor cleaning uh, day, day having more touch points for cleaning will be really good, but making sure that that closing procedure, that floor cleaning is one of the top priorities before you close that patio. Um, you wanna make sure that you're removing as much as you possibly can with a good deep clean of that floor with those peanuts before that closing because the overnight on the patio, um, if you're leaving food outside overnight, that's definitely going to be a very big attractant. So um, those are some of the regular procedures. Um, and then perimeter uh, baiting was another good uh, tip that could then go specifically after the rodents. So while we're working on then um, working on fixing those procedures, um, we already do have a rodent issue. They know that they want to come to that space. So we do have to dissuade them from coming to that space. So that's where perimeter baiting um, would be a good tool to introduce in that case as well. Um, second case study, uh, flying bugs at night. So uh, night patio dining is definitely uh, something that, um, that we see a lot of interest for as well. Um, especially in hotter places um, where uh, it's much more pleasant to sit outside in the evenings and once the sun's down, um, we want to make sure that we have a good uh, experience for guests in that situation. Um, but one customer situation that we have seen previously is the bright lighting in the spaces uh, was attracting lots of uh, open flying bugs to that space. Um, uh, in general, um, with this situation specifically, there was a large amount of different insects bombarding the guests. So it wasn't necessarily one pest issue that was regularly seen. Um, it was more of a wide variety of flying insects that were seen coming into the space. Um, so um, our experts were able to look at this case and say, yes, we have a large amount of flying insects. It's most likely going to be attraction to the light that is bringing them to that space. Um, not necessarily an uncommon fact, but what can we then do to help prevent a, uh, or implement a situation to help prevent that? Um, so one thing that was recommended um, was uh, actually changing the light frequency. So this is one area that our, um, our pest experts can really come in handy on, on, all, the, on all the tools that they know, because I, as a, I'm not a pest expert myself, I never would have thought of this, but uh, a lot of the flying insects that they were seeing were actually more uh, attracted to UVs coming, uh, being emitted from their light sources. Um, so by switching their light sources to non-UV emitting, um, which usually equates to a more yellow light than a more white light, um, that actually can help uh, significantly reduce the amount of flying insects that are then attracted to those lights. So um a relatively simple fix can usually just be something as, as easy as, as buying a different type, type of light bulb um, can go a long way to help uh, help with those insect issues. Um, another thing um, is thinking about uh, large insect blooms um, and uh, an example, mayflies, and thinking about, well, maybe this is just a, a time of a couple weeks that um, I know that there's an insect bloom going on. Um, and uh, it might not be a good idea to operate my patio during that time. Um, so if you're seeing some of those specific issues, um, if you have a pest, uh, a pest provider that's helping you out with that space, they should be able to help provide you with some of that information. Maybe there's a specific bloom going on that's causing those issues. Um, and uh, at that point, maybe it's, it's, there's a, a hard mitigation time, but maybe we know, oh, it's only gonna be a couple weeks. Maybe the patio just can't be operable during that time at night. Um, additionally, this could be another area where we can look at some of those, uh, those bigger factors coming in, like, um, like screen surfaces, those physical barriers to keep, uh, insects from getting in. That's another potential solution that could be utilized in this, in this case. So we got another question back to oh, yeah. flying insects. Yeah. Um, and certainly one that affects us here in Florida. What is the best remedy for mosquitoes, indoor and outdoor? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, um, mosquitoes, it's, uh, I think most of the U.S. probably struggles with them at different times. Um, so usually with mosquitoes, um, obviously they're attracted most commonly to, uh, to diners themselves. 
Um, so that can be uh, definitely a hard one to mitigate because you can't necessarily have, uh, you don't want less people coming to your patio. Um, so often I think when mosquito challenges get pretty rough, um, that's a good opportunity to go to your pest provider for a pest specific solution. Um, so um, most commonly that's going to be something that specifically targets mosquitoes like um, like attraction fly traps, um, not fly traps, but um, an equivalent of a fly trap for a mosquito that will really help uh, help attract those insects. Um, there's a lot of other things uh, available that can be utilized, um, like some of the um, uh, kind of mosquito, um, blanking on the word, but some of those specific mosquito uh, light, lights that can be used that um, that emit something that uh, that that dissuades the mosquitoes from coming. That's usually going to be um, the best uh, avenue to take with mosquitoes, just because uh, sanitization and that sort of thing doesn't necessarily affect the mosquitoes coming in. Um, if you struggle with really bad mosquitoes, that can definitely also be an area where looking at uh, a screened in porch um, can definitely be helpful. Um, but yeah, when we get to those mosquitoes, definitely having something like those specific solutions um, uh, to the to the bug will be the most helpful. I don't have uh, any specific examples in this deck, but if you are interested, um, I don't know if contact information is going to be sent out post this presentation, um, but definitely feel free to send me an email and I can come up, I can get back to you with some specific um, solutions as well. We absolutely can share that. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, final takeaways, and I think we're getting close to time, so this is uh, timed pretty well. Um, but uh, with your patio, as well as with the rest of your spaces, um, a lot of it comes down to ensuring that you have the right products to solve unique issues of cleanliness that you might be seeing, whether that's indoor, outdoor. Um, but outdoor does uh, introduce uh, potentially a lot of different factors that we want to look at mitigating. So um, if you're going to be operating a patio, make sure that you look at what you're utilizing and say, do we have all the right tools here to help with this issue? Um, and then do we have the right procedures and are we training our staff on the proper procedures to help utilize those tools as well? Um, treat messes quickly uh, is one of the biggest takeaways on uh, keeping away pests and also keeping that space in the most, uh, in the most uh, cleanly environment that we can. Um, Patios just uh, much different from the indoor spaces. We want to make sure that we're getting messes picked up and cleaned uh, as quickly as possible to help uh, to help keep unwanted visitors away. Um, and uh, by helping to maintain your clean and uh, healthy outdoor space, um, this will really help drive people towards your your restaurant in those operable months um, and get you the most use out of that space. Um, so making sure that you think about your specific uh, environment that you are operating in um, and what specifically you need to help make sure that you that you can keep that patio open as long as possible um, will give you really the best benefits out of that space. So that is all I have for today. Are there any additional questions the rest of the time? I don't see any that have come through. So with that, I want to say thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you, Ecolab, for putting on this presentation. We will be sharing um, a recording of this as well as a survey so that everyone can claim their free continuing education hour. Um, please feel free to share that if you have any team members or anyone um, that you know that might be struggling with some of these issues or could use the continuing education hour. Um, with that, if there's any um, contact information from Laura and any, if there's resources or anything like that, you will get all of that. So thank you. I want to let you know about a couple of upcoming webinars we have. October 30th, Amy Ward is going to talk about our October trend, the new bar. And then on November 20th, we have Chef Kurt, who is going to present on a global mashup of flavors. Um, and that's more on November's trend. So look for these upcoming webinars. You can find them in our emails like TCI or on our website and the events tab. And on behalf of ACF National Office, thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day.